And so this morning, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Accepting hardship as a pathway to peace. Several years ago, there was a book written by a noted educator titled, Life is Not Fair, and Everything Else They Forgot to Teach You in School. And I think you could change that title to this. Life is not fair, God never promised it, and other things Christians forget to learn. The serenity prayer would remind you and me that indeed life is not fair. I said on the first sermon on September the 1st when we read the part of the prayer that goes, uh, give me serenity to accept the things that cannot be changed, that if you and I were in control of life, we would do things very differently than God. Because we see the world and our lives and we see too much suffering, too much hardship, too many inequities, too many unanswered questions. So if we were in charge, we would not let the world be as unfair and as full of hardship as it now is. We've got one of three responses that you can make to the fact that life is hard and it's unfair. One, you can give up on God. You can just decide that you'll be an agnostic or an atheist because you cannot accept a loving and caring God who would allow such hardship and such uh, difficulty in our lives. Or you can still believe in God, but stay angry at God. You can believe in Him, but be constantly discontented with the way He does things. Or you can accept that God's ways are better than our ways. And that while we might not understand them, God has purpose in why He does what He does. The question then is, what purpose could God possibly have for allowing hardship in our lives? And the answer to that has been given throughout Christian history. Theologians for ages have told us that in order for us to be the persons God would have us be, in order for us to be shaped and formed as the persons God, ha God would have us be, then we must face difficulty in our lives. You will never be, and I will never be, the persons of spiritual maturity that God needs us to be without hardship. You know the name Helen Keller, of course. Helen Keller was the little girl at 19 months who contracted a disease and it left her blind and deaf. You know the wonderful story of Ann Sullivan coming into Helen Keller's life at age seven and, and uh, helping Helen Keller then live a productive, inspiring, uh, and in encouraging life. And Helen Keller often talked about the fact that she actually thanked God for her condition. And whenever Helen Keller would speak about her life and God's presence in her life, she would always talk about the fact that her difficulties enabled her to be who she was. Listen to some of the words of Helen Keller. We could never learn to be brave and patient if there were only joy in the world. I thank God every day for my handicaps, for through them I have found myself, my work, and my God. Character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened, vision cleared, ambition inspired, and success achieved. Help me accept that the hardships of this life are actually for my benefit. Help me accept that the difficulties of this life actually are the venue, one of the venues through which God, you will help me be the person I'm meant to be. Taking this world as Jesus did, as it is, not as I would have it. Taking this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. We've got to be honest here. There seems a serious incongruity in this prayer. 
Just last week, I talked about the part of the prayer that says, give me courage to change the things that should be changed. And I talked in that sermon about the necessity of each of us standing up in courage to address evil and injustice and, and uh, heartache in this world. And then we come along and pray, uh, let me take this world as it is, sinful as it is, just as Jesus did, not as I would have it. And you got to wonder which it is. Do I have the courage to try to change this world or do I accept this sinful world as it is? And the answer is both. God does want us to step up in courage and address the evils of this world. God does want us in courage to address the injustices of this world. God does want us in courage to make this a world a better place. But you're in trouble and I'm in trouble if we believe for one moment that our efforts, however diligent, however faithful, however courageous, are going to guarantee that this world becomes what you want it to become and what I want it to become. God does not promise any of us that no matter how courageous we are, how faithful we are, how diligent we are in advancing the cause of the kingdom, that we're going to get to see the world we want to see. There is still going to be evil. There is still going to be sin. There is still going to be wrongdoing. The world is still going to displease you and the world is still going to displease me. The question is, can I live with that? Can you live with that? Can you accept with God's help that when you are courageous and do the best you can, that God will use that, but He's not going to promise you and He's not going to promise me that our efforts will make this world what it needs to be. A good way to set yourself up for despair is to believe that your courageous actions are indeed going to change the world the way you want it or the way I want it. God, give me strength to be courageous, but give me wisdom to understand that there's no promise that the world is going to become what I want it to become. Trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will. I hope you believe that. I hope in the depths of your soul, in the innermost parts of your spiritual life, deep within the recesses of your relationship with God, that you without a question believe that someday God will make all things right. The Apostle Paul in the book of Romans says it this way, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Do you have that conviction? Do you have that conviction that however things seem in this world and however far things go in this world, and however displeasing this world can be to you and to me at times, that God will someday make all things right. One of the most inspiring sections of the Bible is found in Revelation 21, where the writer of Revelation writes about a new day coming. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, God will be with His people and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making all things new. I believe that. I plant my faith in that. I hang my spiritual life on that. That God is going to make someday all things new. Here's my personal affirmation. Someday God will make it all right. Someday the innocent who suffer now will receive special reward. Someday the tragedies and hardships of this life will give way to profound blessing. Someday we will know a joy this life could never bring. Someday we will smile with wonderment at the absolute goodness of God. Someday we will stand in amazement at all that God has done and is doing. Someday, some glad day, God will prove Himself to you and me to be wise and good and just.
so that I may be reasonably happy in this life. Don't you wish that Niebuhr had prayed so that I may be perfectly happy in this life? So that I may be fully happy in this life? So that I may be absolutely happy in this life? Well, he didn't. He rightly prayed that I may be reasonably happy in this life. Because the fact is, and you know this as well as I do, you are not going to be, nor am I going to be, perfectly happy in this life. We've already said that. Life is not going to grant you or grant me all that we need or want in order to be perfectly happy. But we can be contented. I love Philippians 4.11 where Paul says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. And notice what Paul says, I've learned to be content. It didn't come naturally. I wanted to be perfectly happy. I didn't want some of the circumstances of my life, Paul would say. But he said, I've learned with God's help to be content in all the circumstances. That's what you're praying. When you pray that I may be reasonably happy in this life, you and I are praying that we may be spiritually content even when things aren't so good. And in the passage I read this morning from 2 Corinthians, Paul said, and this is a contented life, I may be hard-pressed, but I refuse to be crushed. I may be per perplexed, but I will not give in to despair. I may be persecuted, but I will not feel abandoned. I may be struck down, but I will not, I will not be spiritually destroyed. There's a minister I know who had a church member who was facing a very critical surgery. He'd been battling a serious illness for some time. And finally they decided the only option for this serious illness was for him to have life-threatening surgery. The surgery might help the illness, the surgery might kill him. And the pastor tells about visiting this church member in the hospital room uh, the night before the surgery and talking with him about all that lie ahead. They chatted for a while. He had been his pastor for some years. They were close. They just kind of chit-chatted. and Then they had prayer. And then the pastor says that he turned to go out of the room. But instead he turned around and he said, John... Are you ready for this surgery? John, are you really at peace about this? And that pastor writes that John hesitated for a moment, and then he said this, Pastor, I'm at peace. You see, I will be tomorrow where I am today in the hands of my loving God. I will be tomorrow, whatever the circumstances, where I am today, whatever the circumstances, in the hands of my loving God. To be a mature, contented Christian is to accept that the circumstances of life many times aren't going to please you, but to be willing to be at peace in the one assurance you're in the hands of God. Today, tomorrow, and the next day. Which leads to the final part of the prayer, and supremely happy with you forever in the next. There can be no equivocation. There can be no doubt. There can be no question that there is life beyond this life. And in, that in the life beyond this life, it's all settled. When all the dust settles and history has marched its long road and our lives have come to their end, we have to believe that God indeed then is going to grant us the supreme happiness we sought in this life. It won't come here, but it will come there. John Wesley, as you know, is the founder of Methodism. He died in 1791 at 88 years of age. And those who were present at Wesley's dying moments said that he said this, The best of all, God is with us. 
dying man, a little strength. And he just says, the best of all, God is with us. And he raised his hands upward. And he said once again, before dying, the best of all, God is with us. Someday, he will be our God. And we will be his people. He will be with us and we will be with him. And there will be no more mourning or crying or pain or suffering or injustice or evil or discontent or heartache. For we will be supremely happy in the gift of the kingdom that God brings to us. Thanks be to God. Accepting hardship is a pathway to peace, which means that we accept that the difficulties of our lives are God's purpose, and they strengthen us spiritually. Taking this sinful world, not as I would have it, but as it is. Having the courage to stand against that which needs to change, but accepting that the world doesn't change on our terms. Trusting that indeed God will make all things right. Trusting that we can be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy in the next. I invite you now to take your serenity prayer, which is on the prayer card that you were given. And our affirmation of faith is going to be the serenity prayer this morning. So would you stand and let us affirm our faith together.